Okay, well, this evening we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. And I've already told you what this is about. This is um, James vindicating God as being, you know, without blame with regard to any sin, any evil that might arise from the trials that we have to endure. So, James writes this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that, we'd be, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. Well, may the Lord bless his, uh, his word to our understanding this evening. Now, remember, James has been telling us that because the Lord loves us, he sends trials. Uh, it's, it's a form of training. It's, it's a form of discipline. And discipline, remember, is not always um, corrective, but it is always instructional. And the Lord is instructing us. He's training us. He's strengthening us. He's helping us to grow, to become more like Jesus. And we don't become more like Jesus when things are easy. We become more like Jesus when things get hard. And James told us, because these trials are meant for our good, because God means them for our good, that we should be thankful. We should rejoice in these things, not because of the trial itself, but because of what the Lord is working through them. But remember last week, he reminded us of the importance that we pass these tests. Okay? Trials are meant to help us grow, that's true. But they're also meant to test our faith, to show us, not God, but to show us whether our faith is genuine or not. If we pass the test, it's genuine. If we don't, it's not. Remember how Jesus illustrates this in the parable of the sower? You know, it's, it's quite clear the seed sown on the path represents, you know, that the birds eat up the seed, never penetrates, never produces any fruit, clearly represents those who never receive the gospel. That which falls into the good soil and produces fruit clearly represents those who receive the word and who receive Christ and are truly born again. But the other two represent false conversions. The seed sown among the thorns that looked hopeful, it looked hopeful at least until it was choked out by the wealth and cares of this world, it produces no fruit. And as Jesus tells us in John 15, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit is, is cut off and thrown into the fire. But then there's the seed that's sown in the rocky soil that also looked good because it sprung up quite quickly uh, because it didn't have depth of soil. But as soon as the sun rises, it scorches it and it withers and dies and it doesn't bear any fruit. That is referring to the heat of a trial that causes this so-called faith or profession of faith to wither and die. That represents someone who underwent a trial but did not endure, did not persevere. James tells us we must persevere through these trials if we hope to receive the crown of life, if we are to enter at last into heaven. Now, James is not telling us that our perseverance, our endurance earns the prize. It simply reveals that God has given to us saving faith. Okay, a faith that goes beyond a mere belief in the facts, a faith that goes beyond uh, simply praying the sinner's prayer. It's the kind of faith that will not let go of Christ no matter what we have to face, no matter what the cost. It is that faith, and again, I'm going to use the L word, okay? It is that faith that is animated, that is given life by the love the Spirit of God gives us. That love is a love that will never let go of Christ, regardless of the difficulties we have to face. Well, all this talk about trials, okay, how the Lord sends them, how the Lord is using them for His good purposes, and how they often entail 
difficult circumstances at the hands of the wicked, as we know from our own experience, or temptations to various sins might lead us to think that God somehow is the one causing the evil or the temptation. And so James wants to address that next. And he tells us in this portion, in no uncertain terms, that God is not the author of evil, but God is the author of everything good. And the only reason we give in to sin is not because of God, it's not his fault, it's, it's ours. Now, I've already told you that what James gives us here is what we call a theodicy. And the word theodicy, you can see the, the first part of it is referring to God, you know, theos, theo. The other is, um, you know, the Greek word uh, dikao means basically to justify God. It means to justify. So this is a justification of God. And what it is is a vindication of him from any wrongdoing with regard to this matter of, of temptation and, and trial. Now, in one sense, we realize God should never need vindication because God is absolutely perfect, and we're going to look a little bit more at that. But what James is talking about here is that from time to time, he may need to be vindicated from those who falsely accuse him. And apparently, that was the case here. James writes this, Let no one say... When he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Or perhaps more accurately, this could be translated, stop saying that God is the one who is tempting you. Uh, and why is that? Uh, well, because God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Okay, now it appears as though there were those who were blaming God uh, for their sins. But James is saying you can't blame God. You can only blame yourself. God is, is infinitely, absolutely holy. He says he is not at all inclined towards evil, nor will he ever tempt anyone. You know, the odd thing is that there are those who argue uh, that he actually does do this. And maybe we've thought that at one time or another. Um, think about this. Uh, we do know, for instance, that God created everything, right? Right? And we know that evil exists in this world, okay? It, that is uh, undeniable. Well, if God created all things and evil exists in this world, then the conclusion that, that's typically drawn is God must be the one who made it since he made all things. You know, I don't know if you've ever run into anybody who believes that. Um, actually, we, we had a member of, of a church years ago who actually believed that that was true, and he was representing a group of people who also taught this, uh, he believed that that's actually what God says in the Bible. And, and okay, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, say that the reason why he believed God was the author of evil was because he believed the Bible, and God says in the Bible that he actually is. And he was looking at this passage in Isaiah. And I'm sure you've heard it before, but listen to it. In the King James, and by the way, this group that, that he was representing believed in, in the King James is the only version you should be reading, okay? God says through Isaiah, in Isaiah 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, you know, what more do you need? I mean, God himself says, I create evil, now, thankfully, what he says is more clearly articulated in the uh, New American Standard and other versions of the Bible that are perhaps a little newer. And it, it reads this way in Isaiah 45, verse 7, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity, I am the Lord who does all these things. I want you to notice that in this passage that you have these these concepts that are sort of held that are, that are opposites, right? I, I create or I form light and I create darkness. Light and darkness are opposites. And then he says, I cause well-being or I make peace and I create calamity or as the King James puts it, evil. But what, what is the calamity that's being referred to here that's the opposite of peace? Well, it's not peace and evil, but it's peace and, and war, okay? 
Uh, the Lord sometimes grants peace and sometimes He ordains that there would be war. I, the Lord, do all these things. And we're going to see exactly His relationship okay, to that war or to that calamity. Okay? God uses the evil that is in the world for His purposes. But James is telling us that God does not create it. Now, I was going to say, sadly, the person I, I knew that um, uh, actually held this belief no longer professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that kind of a view of God is a harsh view. He also believes that God created um, a, certain, a certain number of people, the vast majority of mankind. He created them in order to destroy them. Uh, that God actually ordained the fall so he would have a reason to destroy them. That was his thinking. And that, that's really a, a very harsh view of God who is absolutely gracious and holy and merciful in, in every way. So now we need to ask this question. If God did not create evil, then where did the evil come from? Okay. Well, one way of answering this is that it came from the creatures that he created. Now, there's a problem with that view. Uh, the problem is that creatures can't create. <laughs> Only God can create. Um, so that creates a problem with this particular solution. Now, we also know that everything that God created, He created good. And that's what he, is, he said. Everything is good. Moses tells us in Genesis that after He had made everything that He had made in the six days, that he pronounced it not only good, but he, he said it was very good, okay? In Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he made. Behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And what he means by that is everything was exactly the way he wanted it to be. Everything was, was set up to yield to man everything that man would need in order to subdue the earth for the glory of God. It also means that everything, every one of his rational creatures, which would include man and the angels at that particular junction, were morally good. And they, were, they had really no other desire in their heart but to worship and serve the Lord. But by the time we get to chapter 3, Moses tells us about this malignant spirit that possesses a serpent or snake and who tempts Eve... And she falls, and then she gives to her husband, and, and he falls. And we have to ask the question, what happened? Where did all this evil come from? Well, God didn't, after the sixth day, you know, suddenly create evil. James tells us he is not tempted by evil. He doesn't tempt anyone, you know, with, with evil. God is not the source of evil. But we do know from the Scripture that one of his creatures... An archangel by the name of Lucifer was filled with pride because of his beauty and power, and he tried to usurp God. And because of this, he was cast out of heaven. And at that time, remember, heaven was seemingly represented uh, by Ezekiel uh, as, a, as a, on top of a mountain in the garden. And so being cast off the, the mountain of God, he's cast into the garden of God, and he immediately sets about to destroy God's creation by causing the one who is in charge of the creation, who is Adam, to fall into sin and to bring God's curse upon the entire creation and upon really all of uh, Adam's posterity. So we see that evil first came from Lucifer, but we have to ask the question, where did that evil come from? That was in Lucifer's heart. We know that God didn't create it, and we know that Lucifer really couldn't have created it. We know it didn't spontaneously generate. Everything has to have a cause, okay? So we have to ask, what is the cause? Well, this is the cause. And I think it's really the only possible explanation that having rebelled against God, having... Um, well, again, it, we, I guess we have to ask the question, where does that pride come in the first place? We do know that in his pride, somehow, he lost the spirit who filled even, even Lucifer's heart. Sounds kind of strange to say that, doesn't it? But everyone who was morally good 
was filled with the Spirit because the Spirit is that love. The Spirit is that good within any of God's rational creatures. Lucifer lost the Spirit. He lost the Holy Spirit, and in losing the Spirit, he became evil. It came from a choice that he made. Now, Edwards explains it in this way, and I think it makes sense. Okay, when we think about darkness, what is darkness? Is darkness, does it have some kind of existence or not? Okay. Well, actually, darkness is the absence of light. What about cold? You know, what, what is its, you know, we, we think about what is, you know, how would you explain cold? What is its, you know, the word is ontology. What is it in its essence and its being? Well, cold is simply the absence of heat. It isn't anything different. It's, it's on this scale of, you know, moving from warmth to the loss of warmth. It gets, the more you lose it, the colder it gets, that type of thing. Well, the same thing is true of good and evil. So Jane, uh, Jonathan Edwards explains it this way, as, as darkness is the absence of light, and as cold is the absence of heat, so evil is the absence of good. Okay? It is, in this case, the absence of the Holy Spirit. When Lucifer lost God's Spirit, who made him good, the absence of that good is what made him evil. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's God's absence, okay, that makes evil is, is the point. It's not something he creates, and it's not something, um, you know, well, it's not something he creates. It's not his presence. It's, it's essentially his, his absence. And think about this as well. We all come into the world in rebellion against God, hating God, at war with God, you know, David talks about being conceived and born in sin. And the question is, why? Why does that happen? Well, we know it's because of Adam. We know it's because of his sin. We know it's uh, because that sin's imputed to us. But, but there's something that's missing, you see, in us that actually is restored through the work of redemption. And that is we come into this world without the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, um, uh, the term original righteousness and original, actually two terms, original sin. When we talk about original righteousness, we're talking about the origin of our acts of righteousness. When we talk about original sin, we're not talking about the, the first sin that was ever committed, which would have been Lucifer's actually. And we're not talking about Adam's first sin, but we're talking about the origin of sin or our sins, okay? Now, when we had the Holy Spirit, we had original righteousness. We had this desire within us to do good. But when we lost the Holy Spirit, then we had original sin, which is the desire to do evil. So again, you see the problem here. The problem is the loss or the lack of the Holy Spirit. We come into the world without the Holy Spirit. And the only reason that we're not as bad as the devil when we come into the world. And actually, we do have the same nature as the devil when we come into the world hating God and rebellion against God. But the only reason we're not as bad as he is is because God is restraining that sin. Again, in a variety of ways, through laws, through society, by keeping up, you know, just making us want to keep up appearances in a variety of ways, even holding back something of that corruption in our souls. But the reason we're bad is not because there is something that exists called evil that's inside our heart, but it's because of something that's missing in our hearts, and that is the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit before we can be good. Again, I just want to remind you what we saw this morning, and that is you know, the, how the one way that Jonathan Edwards characterizes the, um, the covenant of grace. He says, the Father gives the price. He gives His Son. The son comes and he pays the price. He gives his life. But he gives his life so that he might purchase something for us. And that is the spirit. So that the spirit might inhabit us and the spirit might make us good again. That he might make us like Jesus. Now we know that doesn't happen perfectly in this life. But it does happen. And the only reason it happens, the only reason why we begin moving in the right direction and do good things is because of the Spirit of God working in our hearts. 
So God does not create evil. Evil doesn't actually have an independent existence. It's not something God made. It's not something the creature made. Evil is the absence of God's presence. It's the absence of his spirit. It's the absence of good. So then a second question we need to ask is this, that if God knew that Lucifer was going to fall and he was going to become this wicked being, why didn't he prevent it? Okay, why didn't he prevent it? Either by not creating Lucifer in the first place or by keeping him from falling. And since he didn't prevent it when God could have prevented it, doesn't it make him some way responsible for our sins? Well, again, James is saying the answer to that question is no. God is not responsible. He emphasizes the fact that God is good. God is absolutely good. He's absolutely holy. Everything that he does is good. Everything he created is good. Every good gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. When God created what he made, and even when he created Lucifer, he created a being who was very good. And he even put him in a very perfect and holy place in heaven. The fact that Lucifer fell, that he decided to do what he did, that blame falls on Lucifer himself, not on God. God cannot be held responsible for Lucifer's actions any more than he can be held responsible for all the sins that are going on in this world. God created this world knowing that it would be filled with, with a world of sinful people. So is God responsible for their sins? Well, of course he isn't. God even allowing mankind to exist is infinite mercy. And when men sin, they sin against infinite goodness. They are the ones to blame. See, the real question we need to ask is this. Why does God allow evil in the first place? Why does he allow it to come into his creation for these rational creatures to make decisions that, that end in the loss of the spirit that creates this evil? Why did he do that? Well, John Gerson was asked that question on one occasion, and he answered it this way. He says, because it's good that there is evil. And that that's, it will require a little bit of explanation. It's, it's good that there is evil, not that evil is good, but that God allows evil because of the good that he's going to bring out of that evil. And here I think we need to remember again why it is that God created everything that he made. It wasn't so, you know, necessarily for the good of all of his creatures. It was originally, but after the fall, that wasn't the case. God created everything that he did for his glory. And in order to glorify himself, in order to show us everything that is true about himself, evil had to come into the world. Without evil, we would not know about God's grace. Without evil, we would not know about God's mercy. Without evil, we would not know about God's judgment. And his, well, again, we wouldn't know how much, how thankful we should be for God's having saved us. All of these things come about because of evil. And let me give you a couple of examples of, of what John Gerstner meant when he says it's good that there's evil, okay? And how God uses evil for good purposes. Remember what Joseph's brothers did to him. I think that's kind of the classic example, isn't it? Because of their jealousy, they kidnapped him, they threw him into a pit, they wanted to kill him. They were going to kill him until one of the brothers interceded. And instead, they sold him to a group of slave traders who eventually sold him to Potiphar in Egypt. What the brothers did was evil. But remember that what they did was something that God had intended, something he allowed, something that was a part of his plan, and how he brought good from it. He saved his people from the famine. Remember what Joseph said to his brothers when he confronted them after he revealed himself in Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God, God what meant, meant, what, uh, meant what for good? What the brothers did. This, this selling him as a slave into Egypt, which was evil, you meant it for evil. You did it out of an evil intent, but God meant it. That, that same, those same actions, he meant them for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. God used their evil for good purposes. Consider also the crucifixion. 
after the apostles were arrested and released, and then they went and reported what had happened, they all lifted up their voices to, to the Lord in prayer. And in their prayer, they say this, sounds like a corporate prayer, in Acts 4, verses 27 through 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So they united to put Jesus to death. They meant it for evil. It was the greatest crime ever committed in this world. But God predestined this, he purposed this, he predetermined this would take place for the greatest good that has ever taken place in the history of the world, and that is the salvation of mankind. So the point is, God is not the author of evil. God is the author of good. Every good thing, every, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good thing we've received or we ever will receive comes from our pure and gracious and holy Heavenly Father, especially our salvation brought about, again, as I said before, through the greatest evil that has ever been perpetrated in the history of the world. Uh, in verse 18, in the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. And that, again, is referring not only to the work He did through Christ, but also the work He does by His Spirit empowering the gospel to save us. So, God is not tempted by evil. God does not tempt anyone. Um, the evil does not come from God. So what James is telling us here is this, that we cannot blame God. We can't blame God for our sins or for any of the evil that's in the world. We can only blame ourselves. And then he goes on to describe how sin works, you know, how temptation works, why it is we fall into sin. First, he says there's temptation. He says in verse 14, but each one is tempted. Now, it's inevitable that we're going to be tempted because of the evil that's in this world, because of the absence of God's uh, goodness, of His presence, of His Spirit, because of the rebellion of mankind against Him. There is evil in the world. And because there is evil in the world, we're going to brush up against it, and we're going to be tempted by it, you know, either by our flesh, the evil that's in us, or perhaps um, one of the evil spirits that is in the world, a part of Satan's army. But we need to realize at the same time that just because there's evil in the world, that, doesn't, that, that alone is not enough to make us fall into sin, James wants us to realize. Jesus was in the world, and there was sin in the world, and Jesus was tempted by that sin. The devil tempted him at the end of that time. He was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and yet he did not sin. So the fact that there is Sin in the world, and there's going to be temptation, is not enough to make a sin. Secondly, James tells us there is also the internal temptation. He says in verse 14, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Okay? So the problem, again, is with us. Now, we've already seen that we come into the world without the Spirit of God. And without Him, without His goodness and His love, there is only evil, there is only lust in our hearts. And that's what takes hold of the temptation. And by the way, even after the Spirit of God is in our hearts, we know there is still the old man, he's still alive, there's still corruption in us, there's still lust, and there's still desire for sin, so we are still liable, okay? Now thirdly, when that external temptation takes hold of the lust, or I should say the lust in our hearts, takes hold of the temptation that is in the world, James is telling us we will sin. That is the cause of our sin. He says in verse 15, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. You know, years ago when I first candidated for this church, and it's, how long has it been? Hmm, 30 years? Yeah, it's been a long time. I was preaching on that very topic, and I used this very illustration. 
It, it stuck with me uh, ever since. John Owen, you know, represents this as two hands. You know, we have this hand of temptation coming from this corrupt world that's reaching out towards us, and we have this other hand that's coming from our hearts, our lusts. And John Owen says, if those two hands get together and they take hold of each other, you know, when the temptation gets hold of our lusts or when the lust, lust of our hearts gets hold of the temptation, he says there's little hope that we can break that grip. We will fall. We will sin. And then James tells us finally when that happens, when we sin, we become liable to death. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Where does the death come from? The death comes from the temptation that takes, entices us. It, it takes hold of our lust. We sin, and sin brings forth death. Now, it is true that for us as believers, no sin that we commit will ever destroy us. Okay? That's what our sins deserve, death. But we are forgiven in Christ. This should never excuse sin, but it should always give us hope when we do sin, okay? that our sins are forgiven in Christ. But it's also true at the same time that any one of our sins would have killed us forever, would have forever destroyed us if it were not for God's forgiveness. Sin brings death. And James wants us to think about that so that we don't give in to the temptation. We don't let our lust take hold of it. We stay away from it, okay? So God does not tempt us to sin. We sin when we are carried away by our own lusts, and we cannot blame God. We can only blame ourselves. And James says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, okay? This is what takes place. We can't blame God. Now, that is the theodicy. That is the justification of God. The blame for sin falls squarely on our shoulders. It doesn't fall on God's shoulders. God is exonerated. But really, I think from what James tells us here, though he doesn't tell us about it right here, uh, what he does tell us is enough to show us, I think, how we can overcome sin. Okay? If the reason that we fall into it is because it's our lust reacting to some temptation then there's really two things that we can do. And really, we're, we're, we're called to do this in other places of Scripture. The first thing that we need to do is put that lust to death. Remember what Paul says in Romans 8, 13? If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That is, if by the Holy Spirit you are killing those lusts of the flesh, you will live. Now, that tells us a couple of things. It tells us, first of all, that we have to do it, okay? If, if we are born again of God, if we have the Spirit, we will be doing it. But it also tells us that it's possible to do it. You know, it's possible to put our lust to death, to put that corruption, to kill it, okay? Let me just mention one other thing that uh, John Owen said, that we do need to be careful when we're fighting against our sins, that we don't just fight against particular sins, but that we fight against sin, okay? And, and the way he puts it is this. Think of sin as, as a tree, a corrupt tree that's growing in our hearts. And it's got all these, um, let, let's say these fruits that it's producing. And all of these fruits are individual sins. Now he says you can go about trying to knock those pieces of fruit off the tree, but the tree's still going to be standing. It's still going to be producing fruit. And you're not going to overcome your sin if you're just dealing with particular sins, he says you need to go for the root of the tree and try to put sin to death. Well, that's what he is telling us here. We need to put sin to death. We need to attack sin in general, which is, of course, the hatred of God and the lack of love that um, is in our hearts for the Lord. So we need to attack that evil, but the way we do it is actually by growing in love growing in our love for God. One other illustration by John Owen, again, the illustration of the two creatures, the two beasts in the room, and you're locked in the room with these two wild beasts, you know, or actually, I'm sorry, one wild beast, and that one wild beast is your corruption, and you have a dagger in your hand, 
and you need to attack it. And if you don't attack it, if you don't stab it, and as he would say, let the blood out of it and make it weaker, it's going to kill you. And he says that, that's what happens to people who profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't attack their sins. Their sins will eventually overcome them and destroy them. But every true believer will attack. Even though you can't kill the beast, you still need to be fighting against it. The other illustration really had to do with the two animals or the two dogs that are fighting, and the one that wins is the one you're going to feed the most, right, in this battle. Or perhaps you have, I don't know, a couple of wild beasts that are fighting. The one that you, that you nurture is the one that's going to win. So don't nurture your flesh, but nurture the spirit, okay? We need to grow in our love for the Lord, and we need to cut off those things that feed the temptations. So we've been looking in the mornings at how we are to nurture our love through the means of grace. We need to remember those things. But I think last Wednesday evening, we also saw something that's very key to this. We need to spend more time in prayer. And we need to remember that prayer is not just giving God the list of the things we want Him to do for us, okay? Lord, save this person, do this person, heal this person, uh, give me this, give me that. But it is communing with Him, fellowshipping with Him. It's meditating on who He is, it's adoring Him, it's thanking Him, it's praising Him. By the way, we're going to be looking at adoration this, this Wednesday. But it's, it's spending time with Him, developing that relationship with Him, speaking with Him, listening to Him as He speaks to us in the Word. We, we have a relationship with God that can be nurtured. We, we, we need to spend time nurturing it by spending time with Him. And actually, this is something we can do throughout the day. Okay, the more time we spend with Him, thinking about Him, again, uh, speaking with Him during the day, making sure we make choices that are honoring to Him throughout the day. The more time we spend with Him, the more we're actually going to love Him. And the more we love Him, the less we're going to love sin. Okay? So strengthen your love for the Lord, and that will weaken your love for the world. And then that's the first part. Okay? That's the part within. Secondly, we need to avoid temptation. Okay? We need particularly to avoid those things we know that we are liable to, steer clear of the things that tempt us to sin. And I think that that's pretty straightforward. So if we walk with the Lord, with Him in the light, as He is in the light, if we stick to His paths, uh, we will avoid the devil's snares. The devil, remember, is the master uh, uh, trapper who knows exactly where to set the snares for us because he knows what we're liable to do. If we stay away from those things and we stick to God's paths walking with him, we will avoid those snares by which we would be you know, trapped and, and fall into sin. And we will experience more of the Lord's blessings, which is ultimately what God desires for us, which is why he tells us to put our sins to death and to walk in His ways so that we will be blessed, that our love for Him will grow. And as we grow in our love for Him, we'll serve Him more, do more of the things that He has called us to do. We will become more like Christ. Well, let's, uh, let's spend just a moment, shall we, in prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do these things to avoid the sin. And let's remember, too, that um, God is not the cause of our sins, that that is really all on us, so that's why we need to avoid it.